1773, when Johnson was 64. In 1773, Johnson's only publication was an edition of his folio dictionary, with additions and corrections. Nor did he, so far as is known, furnish any productions of his fertile pen to any of his numerous friends or dependents, except the preface to his old amunensis, Macbean's Dictionary of Ancient Geography. He, however, wrote, or partly wrote, an epitaph on Mrs. Bell, wife of his friend John Bell Esquire, brother of the Reverend Dr. Bell, prebendary of Westminster, which he printed in his works. It is in English prose and has so little of his manner that I did not believe he had any hand in it till I was satisfied of the fact by the authority of Mr. Bell. His Shakespeare, indeed, which had been received with high approbation by the public and gone through several editions, was this year republished by George Steves, Esquire, a gentleman not only deeply skilled in ancient learning and a very extensive reading in English literature, especially the early writers, but at the same time of acute discernment and elegant taste. It is almost unnecessary to say that by his great and valuable additions to Dr. Johnson's work, he justly obtained considerable reputation. Divisium imperium cum hove Caesar habit. Caesar has divided the kingdom with Jove. From an epigram in the Life of Virgil ascribed to Donatus. To James Boswell, Boswell Esquire. Dear Sir, I have read your kind letter much more than the elegant Pindar which is accompanied. I am always glad to find myself not forgotten, and to be forgotten by you would give me great uneasiness. My northern friends have never been unkind to me. I have from you, dear sir, testimonies of affection, which I have not often been able to excite. And Dr. Beatty rates the testimony which I was desirous of paying to his merit much higher than I should have thought it reasonable to expect. I have heard of your masquerade. This was given by a lady at Edinburgh. What says your synod to such innovations? I am not studiously scrupulous, nor do I think a masquerade either evil in itself, or very likely to be the occasion of evil. Yet, as the world thinks it a very licentious relaxation of manners, I would not have been one of the first maskers in a country where no masquerade has ever been before. Now, there have been masquerades in Scotland, but not for a very long time. A new edition of my great dictionary is printed from a copy which I was persuaded to revise. But having made no preparation, I was able to do very little. Some superfluities I have expunged, and some faults I have corrected, and here and there have scattered a remark. But the main fabric of the work remains as it was. I had looked very little into it since I wrote it, and I think I found it full as often better as worse than I expected. Baretti and Davies have had a furious quarrel. A quarrel, I think, irreconcilable. Dr. Goldsmith has a new comedy, which is expected in the spring. No name is yet given it. The chief diversions arise from the stratagem by which a lover is made to mistake his future father-in-law's house for an inn. This, you see, borders upon farce. The dialogue is quick and gay, and the incidents are so prepared as not to seem improbable. I am sorry that you lost your cause of intromission, because I yet think the arguments on your side unanswerable. But you seem, I think, to say that you gain reputation even by your defeat. Reputation you will daily gain if you keep Lord Onlek's precept in your mind and endeavor to consolidate in your mind a firm and regular system of law instead of picking up occasional fragments. My health seems in general to improve, but I have been troubled for many weeks with a vexatious ketera, which is sometimes sufficiently distressful. I have not found any great effects from bleeding in physics. 
and I am afraid that I must expect help from brighter days and softer air. Write to me now and then, and whatever any good befalls you, make haste to let me know of it, for no one will rejoice at it more than dear sir, your most humble servant. London, February 24th, 1773, Sam Johnson. You continue to stand very high in the favor of Mrs. Thrale. While a former edition of my work was passing through the press, it was unexpectedly favored with a packet from Philadelphia from a Mr. James Abercrombie, a gentleman of that country, who was pleased to honor me with the very high praise of my life, life of Dr. Johnson. To have the fame of my illustrious friend and his faithful biographer echoed from the New World is extremely flattering, and my grateful acknowledgments shall be wafted across the Atlantic. Mr. Abercrombie has politely conferred on me a considerable additional obligation by transmitting to my copies of two letters from Dr. Johnson to American gentlemen. Gladly, sir, says he, would I have sent you the originals, but being the only real relics of the kind of, of the kind in America, they are considered by the possessors of such inestimable value that no possible consideration would induce them to part with them. In some future publication of yours relative to the great and good man, they may perhaps be thought worthy of insertion. Now here's a letter to Mr. B. Blank D. And a footnote says this gentleman is Bond who now resides in America in a public character of considerable dignity, desired that his name might not be transcribed at full length. But it's Mr. Bond. Sir, that is the hurry of a sudden departure. You should yet find leisure to consult my convenience is a degree of kindness in an instance of regard, not only beyond my claims, but above my expectation. You are not mistaken in supposing that I am, I set a high value on my American friends, and that you should confer a very valuable favor upon me by giving me an opportunity of keeping myself in their memory. I have taken the liberty of troubling you with a packet, to which I wish a safe and speedy conveyance, because I wish a safe and speedy voyage to him that conveys it. I am, sir, your most humble servant, London Johnson's Court, Sam Johnson, Fleet Street, March 4th, 1773. The second letter here is to the Reverend Mr. White, footnote says, now Dr. White, and Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Pennsylvania. During his first visit to England in 1771 as a candidate for holy orders, he was several times in company with Dr. Johnson, who expressed a wish to see the edition of his Rasselas, which Dr. White told him had been printed in America. Dr. White, on his return, immediately sent him a copy. Dear Sir, your kindness for your friends accompanies you across the Atlantic. It was long since observed by Horace that no ship could leave care behind. You have been attended in your voyage by other powers, by benevolence and constancy, and I hope care did not offer show, often show her a face in their company. I received the copy of Resselos. That footnote, this Philadelphia edition from 1768 is described in the imprint as printed for every purchaser. <clears throat> the impression is not magnificent, but it flatters an author because the printer seems to have expected that it would be scattered among the people. The little book has been well received and is translated into Italian, French, German, and Dutch. It was... It has now one honor more by an American edition. I know not that much has happened since your departure that can engage your curiosity. Of all public transactions, the whole world is now informed by the newspapers. Opposition seems to despond, and the dissenters, though they have taken advantage of unsettled times, and a government much enfeebled, seem not likely to gain any immunities. Dr. 
John Goldsmith, Dr. Goldsmith has a new comedy. Footnote tells us this is uh, his famous She Stoops to Conquer. In rehearsal at Covent Garden, to which the manager predicts ill success. I hope he will be mistaken. I think it deserves a very kind reception. I shall soon publish a new edition of my large dictionary. I have been persuaded to revise it and have mended some faults, but added a little to its usefulness. No book has been published since your departure, of which much notice is taken. Faction only fills the town with pamphlets, and greater subjects are forgotten in the noise of discord. Thus have I written, only to tell you how little I have to tell. Of myself I can only add that having been afflicted many weeks with a very troublesome cough, I am now recovered. I take the liberty which you gave me of troubling you with a letter, of which you will please to fill up the direction. I am, sir, your most humble servant, Johnson Court, Fleet Street, Sam Johnson, London, March 4th, 1773. On Saturday, April 3rd, the day after my arrival in London this year, I went to Johnson's home late in the evening and sat with Mrs. Williams till he came home. I found in the London Chronicle Dr. Goldsmith's apology to the public for beating Evans, a bookseller, on account of a paragraph in a newspaper published by him, which Goldsmith thought impertinent to him and to a lady of his acquaintance. The apology was written so much in Dr. Johnson's manner that both Mrs. Williams and I suspected it to be his. But when he came home, he soon undeceived us. When he said to Mrs. Williams, Well, Dr. Goldsmith's manifesto has got into your paper. I asked him if Dr. Goldsmith had written it, with an air that made him see I suspected it was his, though subscribed by Goldsmith. Johnson said, Sir, Dr. Goldsmith would no more have asked me to write such a thing as that for him than he would have asked me to feed him with a spoon or to do anything else that denoted his imbecility. I as much believe that he wrote it as if I had seen him do it myself. Sir, had he showed it to any of his friends, he would not have been allowed to publish it. He has indeed done it very well, but it is a foolish thing well done. I suppose he has been so much elated with the success of his new comedy that he thought everything that concerned him must be of importance to the public. I said, I fancy, sir, that in the first time that he has been engaged in such an adventure. That this is the first time. Johnson said, Why, sir, I believe it is the first time he has beat. He may have been beaten before. This, sir, is a new plume to him. I uh, mentioned Sir John Darlyumple's Memoirs of Great Britain in Ireland and his discoveries of the prejudice of Lord Russell and Algernon Sidney. Johnson said, Why, sir, everybody who has just notions of government thought them rascals before. It is well that all mankind now see them to be rascals. I said, but, sir, may not those discoveries be true without them being rascals? Johnson said, Consider, sir, would you any of them have been willing to have had it known that they intrigued with France? Depend upon it, sir, he who does what he is afraid should be known as something rotten about him. This Darlymumple seems to be an honest fellow, for he tells equally what makes against both sides. But nothing can be poorer than his mode of writing. It is the mere bouncing of a schoolboy. Great he, but greater she, and such stuff. I could not agree with him in this criticism, for though Sir John Darlimple's style is not regularly formed in any respect, and one cannot help smiling sometimes at his affected grand eloquence, there is his, in his writing a pointed vivacity and much of a gentlemanly spirit. 
and Mr. Thrales, in the evening, he repeated his usual paradoxical declamation against action in public speaking. Quote, Action can have no effect upon reasonable minds. It may argument, augment noise, but it never can enforce argument. If you speak to a dog, you use action. You hold up your hands thus, because he is a brute. And in proportion as men are removed from brutes, action will have the less influence upon them. Mrs. Thrale said, What then, sir, becomes a demontesis? becomes of Demonthesis's saying, action, action, action. Johnson said, Demonthesis, madame, spoke to an assembly of brutes, to a barbarous people. I thought it extraordinary that he should deny the power of rhetorical action upon human nature, when it is proved by innumerable facts in all stages of society. Reasonable beings are not solely reasonable. They have fancies which may be pleased, passions which may be roused. Lord Chesterfield being mentioned, Johnson remarked that almost all of that celebrated nobleman's witty sayings were puns. He, however, allowed the merit of good wit to his lordship's saying of Lord Tyroly and himself, when both very old and infirm. Tyroly and I have been dead these two years, but we don't choose to have it known. He talked with approbation of an intended edition of The Spectator with notes, two volumes of which had been prepared by a gentleman eminent in the literary world. A footnote tells us this is Percy. And the materials which I had collected from the remainder had been transferred to another hand, this being Dr. John Calder. Johnson observed that all works which describe manners require notes in 60 or 70 years or less, and told us he had communicated all he knew that could throw light upon the spectator. He said, Addison has made his Sir Andrew's Freeport a true Whig, arguing against giving charity to the beggars, and throwing out other such ungracious sentiments, but that he had thought better and made amends by making him found in a hospital for decayed farmers. He called for the volume of the spectator in which that account is contracted, I mean is contained, and read it aloud to us. He read so well that everything acquired additional weight and grace from his utterance. The conversation having turned on modern imitations of ancient ballads, and some one having praised their simplicity, Johnson treated them with that ridicule which he always displayed when the subject was mentioned. He disapproved of introducing scripture phrase into secular discourse. This seemed to me a question of some difficulty. A scripture expression may be used like a highly classical phrase to produce an instantaneous strong impression, and it may be done without it being at all improper. Yet I owe there is danger that applying the language of our sacred book to ordinary subjects may tend to lessen our reverence for it. If therefore it be introduced at all, it should be with very great caution. That's all from Boswell for today. Bye from Boswell.